As we begin our service, let's hear a psalm. It's Psalm 62, Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Would all of you throw him down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? They fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow in your presence this evening. We come to you at the beginning of our time of worship as we began the day in praise and adoration. So we close this day again praising you, glorifying your name, seeking your face, honoring you but we need your help as we do this. So we pray, O oh Lord, that as we draw near to you, through your Holy Spirit, you would draw near to us. And we pray that we might hear your voice and that you might be pleased to hear our voices as we cry out to you. We thank you that we can trust in you at all times and we can pour out our hearts to you, for you are our refuge. Hear our prayers and glorify your name around this world this night, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, our first hymn, number 43, reminds us that we come to a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let's sing to God's praises, number 43, Father of heaven, whose love profound a ransom for our souls has found. 43. We have two Bible readings this evening. The first from the Old Testament, 
So let's turn first to 2 Kings and chapter 4. 2 Kings and chapter 4. And we'll read the first seven verses of this chapter. 2 Kings chapter 4. Let us hear the word of God. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. (laughs) Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go round and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each jar is filled, put it to one side. She left him, and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. We thank God for the reading of his word. Well, shall we come to our God in prayer? Let us all seek him in prayer. O Lord, our God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are ready to hear the prayers and the cries of your children, more ready to hear us pray than we are often to pray. We are sadly slow to come to you. So often in our lives we, we try this and we try that and we talk about this and that and we seek help here and there, but we do not come to you. But Lord, we thank you that when we come, when we seek you, when we pray, you are a God who is ready to hear the cries of your children. We thank you, O Lord, that you put it in our hearts to pray. And we thank you that you give us the strength and the power to pray. Indeed, when words fail us, your Holy Spirit intercedes with groans that words cannot express. We thank you that you read our hearts and we can come and pour out our hearts to you in all of our need. We thank you then that we can come to you. And when we come, we know that we come into a great God, the God of heaven and earth, the creator of all things, the one who was before there ever was a world, before there were any stars, before there was a universe, when there was nothing else, you were there. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in a loving union, But we thank you that you ever determined to make a world, a world of men and women, to give life and to make us in your image. Oh, how we praise you that you are such a God who could speak and this world came into being, that you could put the stars in place and know each one of their names and call them out one by one. We thank you that you are the God who stretched out the heavens in all their vast array. And when we look up and when we see the heavens, when we see the stars and the moon and the sun and all that you have made, it declares your greatness, it declares your power, 
It declares the truth that you are. And Lord, we praise you that although you are such a great creator, you are so concerned about us as human beings. We thank you that though we rebelled against you in that Garden of Eden, and though we've turned our backs upon you, each one of us, to go our own way, that we, like sheep, have all gone astray. Each one of us, every and each one of us, has turned to our own way of living without you, without thinking of you, without worshipping you, without adoring you for who you are. We've gone our own way to create our own life and to do our own thing. And yet, the Lord Jesus came to call wandering sheep back to himself, to seek and to save the lost. We thank you that our dear Lord Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth and lived amongst human beings and lived his life perfectly here, something that we have never done. And we thank you that he then gave that perfect life as a perfect sacrifice on the cross of Calvary with all its cruelty, with all its pain. We thank you that the Lord Jesus went all the way to Calvary for sinners like us. And we rejoice that he rose again and is alive forevermore. And we want to declare to all that Jesus is alive, that he lives and that he is all powerful, that he is crowned with many crowns, that he reigns and rules on high, that he's been given the highest place that heaven affords, and that one day he is coming again in power and in glory with the mighty angels with him. And on that day, this world will come to an end. O oh Lord, we do pray that before that day, many, many would be gathered in to the kingdom of heaven. We pray for the gospel work. We pray for those who will proclaim your word. Lord, raise up new generations of preachers, we pray, for we so need this in our day. So many churches are in need of preachers and pastors. We pray, Lord, that in your mercy you will raise up and call and equip and send your preachers into this world. Pray for ourselves. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us and give us many opportunities when we're asked for the reason, for the hope that we have. We pray that you would grant us the words to say so that we'd be ready to give that reason with gentleness uh, and persuasion and love, but nonetheless showing others that we have a wonderful saviour and a glorious hope. Lord, we live in a world that is often so hopeless and helpless, but we thank you that we have a hope that stretches beyond the grave. Lord, we've heard of those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. And yet we thank you that we do not grieve as those who have no hope because we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that he will one day bring with him those who have fallen asleep in him. So we pray that you would comfort the Joyce family tonight. We pray that they would know your help and blessing. We thank you for a sister who for a time was here. And we pray, Lord, that you will be with the family now. And those members of the family who do not yet know you, and those friends and neighbours, we pray that her life might have testified to her faith in Christ and that you would even use this to draw people to yourself. Lord, we do pray that you would be with each one of us with our varied needs tonight. You know all of our needs and we pray that you would meet them according to your riches in Christ and surprise us with your grace and mercy and be with our friends at home who are unwell and in need. We ask you to draw alongside them specially. And we commit the week ahead of us with all of its trials and tests and joys. And we pray, Lord, that you will be with us in them all. And remember our Sunday school young people. We thank you for them. And we rejoice that we're able to begin again today. And we pray that each one who comes along to the youngest class right up to the oldest, that each one would have that experience of grace that you would touch their hearts and bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus, that they might serve you for all of their days. Hear then our prayers and bring glory and honour to your own name. Forgive our many sins, for we ask our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now our New Testament reading is Luke's Gospel and chapter 12. Luke's Gospel and chapter 12. And once again reading the first seven verses. Luke 12 and verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear, in the inner rooms, will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. We thank God for the reading of his word. Well, uh, let's uh, sing once again. There are some wonderful hymns in our hymn book that bring great comforts. And because we sing them often, hopefully we get to know them and the words go through our heads, perhaps during the week uh, as we're going about our business. And this is one that I think is, is a wonderful hymn to often remember, uh, especially uh, the, the fact that uh, there is always one gate open. There's always one ear that will hear our prayer. We can always come to our great God. It's number 569. Today, thy mercy calls us to wash away our sin. 569. <laughs>
Well, this evening I'd like to take you back to 2 Kings and chapter 4 and to those verses that we read earlier in our service. Now, in this whole chapter, chapter 4 of 2 Kings, we are going to meet four people. Two of them are women, and two of them are men. So there's a very nice balance in that. They are very different people in many ways. The first lady that we shall meet is a widow with two sons. And then we shall meet a childless, well-to-do, married woman. We will then meet a trainee prophet, and finally, a man who happens to have 20 loaves of bread during a time of famine. So why these four? Why these four people? I'm sure in many ways they're representative. I'm sure there were much else that was going on in Elisha's life, but these four people in particular, the Holy Spirit has chosen to have a record of for us in this chapter. They vary very much, don't they, these people? They vary in age uh, and in experience, in wealth and in possessions. But there's two things that are true about each of these people. First of all, they are all nameless. We are not told the names of any of them. Interesting, in the last chapter, we knew the names of the kings, but we don't know the names of these people. They're nameless. And the second thing that's true of all of them is that they are helpless. There's something happening in every one of their lives that makes them completely helpless to do anything to resolve their problems. So we don't know any of their names. They did have names, of course they had names. But we're not told their names. Either because we don't need to know their names, or perhaps because we can identify better with them if we don't know their names. Because they are people like us who most people in the world will never hear about, never know. They won't ever know our names. We tend to think, don't we, that if people know our name, that we will then feel loved and welcomed. Um, I remember many years ago in the 19, 1980s and 1990s, there was a, a sitcom on the tele, television I don't like watching them, but I do like listening to the theme tunes and the songs. And uh, this sitcom was an American one. It was called Cheers. And it was set in a Boston bar. And the bar was called Cheers, where everybody met together. And the idea was it was a wonderful meeting place, a lovely, lovely place to go. And the theme tune really summarized it all because the theme tune is, is called Where Everybody Knows Your Name. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. Nice, isn't it? But of course, it's complete rubbish. It doesn't work like that, does it? We know that gatherings in the world are not places where people can come and share all their troubles. And everybody knows you. Everybody cares. The world isn't like that. We can certainly identify with the troubles of these people, can't we? First of all, the problem is debt. 
That's a big problem, isn't it? Debt. And this debt was a result of a sudden tragedy. That happens, doesn't it? You know, maybe this family was just about keeping their heads above the water, as we say, financially, just about keeping up with repayments on debts, thinking that maybe something would happen and, and they'd be able to get out of this terrible, awful situation uh, of debt, a horrible feeling that you owe so much and you can't pay it back and, and, and just about managing and then suddenly tragedy strikes and the husband and father dies. We can identify with that, can't we? A sudden tragedy and the situation of terrible debt and a feeling of complete helplessness. You can't get out of that. And then secondly, this woman, well-to-do, but she doesn't have a child and must have caused her much grief in her life because she didn't have a child. And then she's given a child. So an unexpected gift, wonderfully. And her life is suddenly filled with great joy. But then, then tragedy strikes again and the boy dies. Awful. You can identify with that, can't we? sudden reversals, the awful things that happen in life. And then the, the third situation, a genuine mistake. We make genuine mistakes, don't we, in our lives? And this, this son of the prophets, he makes a, makes a mistake. He, he gathers some plants and he puts them in the stew and they turn out to be poisonous. He didn't know that. And and it results in terrible consequences for other people. And he can't do anything about it. And then finally, there's a time of famine. And there's just not enough to go round. And this man comes along and he's got just a few loaves. But what are they amongst so many people? So I think we can definitely identify with the troubles that people have. And we all have our own troubles as well, don't we? It doesn't matter how young or how old we are. We do all have troubles and difficulties in our lives. Is it wonderful that having spent some time with kings and politicians in the last chapter, we now see Elisha meeting up with ordinary people, just like you and just like me. And that's really important. We can relate to these people far more easily than we can relate to kings and to politicians. But you know, the great message of this whole chapter is that God is concerned about the helpless and the nameless. God is concerned. Sometimes we wonder, does God really care about me. Why would God be interested in me? I'm nobody. Nobody knows my name. Nobody's interested in me. Does God really know where I am? Does he really understand my needs? He's a God, he's a great God, he's a Lord of heaven and earth, and he's concerned with the great issues of nations, and, and we feel that we can pray to him about Russia and Ukraine. We feel that we can pray to him about the persecuted Christians in many parts of the world, but does he really care about me? Does he understand my needs? Can he do anything about them? And the answer from this chapter is a resounding, yes, he does. But we need to begin at the best place. It's always best to begin at the beginning. So tonight, we'll take a look at the first helpless person. And it's this widow with her two sons facing the awful, awful consequences of death and debt. So what do we learn? Well, you notice that when she comes to Elisha, she says, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. Not very good, the translation, he feared the Lord. He feared the Lord. Do you know, that reminds us, doesn't it, that fearing the Lord is not a vaccine against trouble. 
Fearing the Lord is not a vaccine against trouble. You'd have thought that this man who was one of the company of the prophets, he was one of the schools of prophets, he was there, he was a, a prophet um, and doing a similar work to Elisha, but we know that Elisha uh, had a, a very special calling as a prophet, but this man was also uh, of the company of the prophets. And it's a heartbreaking situation, isn't it? This widow has received a double blow. Her husband is dead and she has now inherited his debts. And his debts do seem to be very large. We know in our own country and through our own laws that debts don't disappear when someone dies. Many, many debts are inherited then by the family. And these debts seem to be huge. She owes an awful lot of money because her husband, for some reason, had incurred these debts. And although it seems really harsh, the creditor is quite within his rights to demand that there is payment and to demand that the family do something to pay them off. And even to, to ask that the sons do that, that pay off the, the debt. It wasn't allowed under Jewish law for him to make them slaves. And that's not right. If you look back in Leviticus chapter 25, you'll discover that he wasn't within his rights to make them slaves, as he says, or as she says he's going to. Leviticus 25 and verse 39. If one of your countrymen becomes poor among you and sells himself to you, do not make him work as a slave. He is to be treated as a hired worker or a temporary resident among you. He is to work for you until the year of Jubilee. Then he and his children are to be released and he will go back to his own clan and to the property of his forefathers. Because the Israelites are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt. They must not be sold as slaves. Do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. So this creditor then, he was not within his rights to take these as slaves, unless, of course, he may not have been an Israelite. Perhaps the debts were incurred with a foreign nation. But under Old Testament law, you could ask that someone worked for you to pay off the debts, but not as a slave. But then as now, people do trample on the law, don't they? And they use it to their own advantage, especially if they're in a strong position and they feel that they have a right to get what is theirs. But this is all made a lot worse in the, in the mind and the heart of this dear lady because her husband was a prophet who feared the Lord. And that's really important for us to know that. He feared the Lord. He was a faithful servant of God. I don't like the word revered that the NIV uses. It's much better to use the word that the older versions use and some of the more modern ones as well. He feared the Lord. But do you think sometimes we don't like that word? We don't like the word fear, the fear of the Lord. Sometimes we seem to shy away from the word, don't we? And we tone it down immediately. And when we start talking about fearing the Lord, we immediately say, well, of course, this means that we are in awe of God. It means that we must revere God. We must have a reverence for God. And then we even go as far as to say, it's not a cringing fear, the fear of the Lord. But hold on a minute. Are we forgetting what the Lord Jesus said? That's why we read Luke 12. Didn't Jesus say, don't be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more Luke 12 verse 5 but I will show you whom you should fear fear him who after the killing of the body has power to throw you into hell yes I tell you fear him and remember the Lord Jesus is speaking to his disciples he's saying to them you don't need to fear people who are powerful in this world. You don't need to fear people who threaten your life. 
People who say, you mustn't be a Christian, you mustn't worship God. If you do, then we're going to take away your freedoms, we're going to take away your buildings, we're going to disrupt your services. You must not do this. And the temptation is to fear that. Powerful people with authority on their side. Ruthless people who might do us harm. People who might even take our lives. And the Lord Jesus says, don't, don't fear them, but fear the one who has power after death to cast you into hell. He's talking about God, talking about his father. We need to have a sense of the greatness and the glory of God. We must not domesticate God. We're good at doing that. We're good at domesticating all sorts of things, aren't we? We can domesticate animals. We can take a wild animal and make a dog out of it, a dog that obeys us. And we can do the same with many other animals. But how dangerous when we begin to think about God in those terms. Our God is a great and awesome God. And his glory he will not share with another. And so we must not fear wicked rulers, persecuting authorities, because there is someone greater than them whom we should fear. Now, we need to remember, when it says that this man feared the Lord, and now he's died, we need to remember perhaps something that had happened. Here was a man who was facing a ruthless regime. Jezebel had been the queen until fairly recently. And in 1 Kings 18 and verse 4, this is what we read. 1 Kings 18 verse 4. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. A terrible, ruthless rule. King Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel ruled in Israel. And Jezebel went on a campaign to deliberately kill off every single one of the prophets of the Lord. How terrifying was that? And yet here we have a man who feared the Lord, and now he's died. Did he perhaps die as part of her ruthless campaign of persecuting and killing the prophets? And yet now this faithful prophet, having been taken away into heaven, where he's very happy and all of his troubles are over, and his fear of the Lord is richly rewarded, by eternal life, yet on earth is left a widow in a terrible, terrible situation. We can think of similar situations perhaps today, can't we? A faithful Christian lady serving as a missionary for many, many years and then towards the end of her life suffering from terrible cancer and in awful suffering. Or well, a faithful Christian daughter spending her life looking after her mother who then has to go into a care home and leaves the daughter homeless and in great need. Christian couple who long for a child and suffers tragedy when that child, that long-awaited child, wastes his life on drugs and turns away from the Lord. You know, there are real situations, aren't there? Many, many others like that, where you say, well, surely if you fear the Lord, and if you love the Lord, then why? Why these situations? And here is an exact example of that with this lady. But you know that the essential lesson is that fearing the Lord is not a vaccine against trouble. That is not the way that it works. We live in a world of great sadness, pain, and loss, and it touches us in so many different ways. 
So there's a first great lesson. Fearing the Lord is not a vaccine against trouble. There's a second. But, yes, fearing the Lord is not a vaccine against trouble, but one ear will always hear our cry. That surely is another lesson from this lady, isn't it? One ear will always hear our cry. You see, there is faith here. This widow has faith. You say, well, hang on, I, I don't see that here. Well, you see it in what she did. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. And that's faith. She cried out to Elisha. She was turning to the Lord in her troubles. You say, hold on, she turned to Elisha. Yes, she did turn to Elisha, but don't forget, Elisha is the man of God. He is the prophet of the Lord. He is the one who has inherited the double portion of Elijah's spirit. He is in so many ways God's representative on earth, bringing God's word to God's people. And so when she cries out to him, in Old Testament terms, she's crying out to the Lord in prayer. You notice that he is called the man of God in this passage. And it's the first time that, she, that he is called the man of God, Elisha. But he's called the man of God many, many, many times. In fact, 76 times in the Old Testament we have this phrase, man of God. And 55 of them are in 1 and 2 Kings. And Elisha is called the man of God more than any other prophet in the Bible. 29 times you'll find Elisha being addressed as the man of God. You see it there in verse 7? She went and told the man of God. And you'll find it seven times in just this one chapter. He's called the man of God. That's no accident, is it? There is something here that we need to take on board. He's the man of God. Who is the man of God? Well, the man of God surely is God's representative on earth, the prophet after God's own heart, the prophet like Moses who points us towards the Lord Jesus Christ, the one great prophet of God. So he is the man of God. But notice that the man of God has the word of God. You can't separate the man of God from the word of God. Yes, throughout this chapter, Elisha keeps being described as a, the man of God. But look at the very last few words of the chapter. Verse 44, Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. So the man of God has the word of God. And that is a truth that comes over into the New Testament. We don't find people in the New Testament being called the man of God in the same way that Elisha was called the man of God. But there is one person in the New Testament who is called the man of God twice. And surprisingly, it isn't the Apostle Paul, it isn't the Apostle Peter, or John, or James, or any of them. It's not one of the Apostles. It's Timothy. Young Timothy is called the man of God in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. He's being encouraged to remember who he is. He's the man of God. He should be a man after God's own heart. He should be a man with the same character of holiness as God. He's the man of God. But also, of course, he is the man of God with the word of God. And again, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed and is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So not just Timothy then, but the man of God has the word of God and must have that character of the man of God, but supremely be tied, tied to the word of God. And that's what we find here in Elisha. He is God's man. He is a man with God's word. 
But the point is, she's coming to speak to him. She's coming to the man of God. And she's crying out to him and she's telling him all of her troubles. And what a privilege it is to take everything to God in prayer. As that lovely hymn puts it, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And that is what she's doing here. And he hears her. She's in a wonderfully privileged position. She might not feel it because things are all falling apart all around her, but she is so much better than her unbelieving neighbor. She is in such a better position. It may be that her neighbor is doing well. It may be that her neighbor's still got her husband. It may be that the neighbor's not in any debt. They might have plenty of money. They might be able to manage. And yet this woman, this poor widow, who's lost her husband as is in such debt and doesn't know what the future is, she is in such a privileged position because she can take it all to the Lord in prayer. Whereas her neighbor has nowhere to go when trouble strikes. And that's our situation, isn't it? What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. She can call upon the Lord in her trouble. So she just brings a problem to God. That's a lovely example to you and me, isn't it? She doesn't try to work the situation out. She doesn't say to Elisha, right, this is a problem and this is what I think needs to happen. She doesn't say to Elisha, can you do this? She, she hasn't got the answers and she doesn't try to work it out. And neither should we. We need to take it to the Lord and just tell him all of our heart, just pour out our hearts to him, as the psalmist says in Psalm 62, verse 8, trust in the Lord at all times. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. We can do that. We can do that. And that's what she did. One ear will always hear our cry. Take encouragement from that. This nameless woman who's so helpless, but she's not helpless because there's something she can do. She can take it to the Lord in prayer and he hears so the fearing the Lord is not a vaccine against trouble, but one ear will always hear our cry because the Lord generously helps the helpless. The Lord generously helps the helpless. So what can I expect when I cry out to the Lord? Well, I can expect him to hear me, and I can expect him to act. He may not act in the way that I expect him to, but he will act. And so many of us here and so many Christians can tell you of numerous ways in which the Lord has met them in their extremity and when they called on him, he answered them in remarkable ways, ways of remarkable providence. And even at times we might think it to be a miracle, the way that God acts. But you notice that Christians don't talk about it a lot. I think that's really important that Christians don't talk about it a lot. You notice that Elisha said to this woman that she's to go around and ask all the neighbors for empty jars. And then he says, go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. And that's what she does. She, she asks, and then she, she shuts the door behind her and her sons. This is something that is done in private. This is something just for her and her sons. This is not something for everybody to know about. Yes, I know we've got it written in the scriptures, so we know about it now. But at the time, it was something that she was not going to go and broadcast to everybody. I think that's important. You know, when God answers your prayers in wonderful ways, remarkable ways, when you're in great need and God comes and meets that need, sometimes it's best not to share that. Sometimes it's best not to go around and say, oh, do you know what the Lord has done for me? Oh, this is great. I needed this and, and this happened and wonderful. No, like this widow, sometimes we need to shut the door. We can see God at work privately but it's not for public broadcast. If we do, 
then a couple of things happen often. First of all, it turns into boasting. And sometimes it gets exaggerated as well. And sometimes the glory is not given to God, but to us. But the other thing that might happen is that other people feel, well, why doesn't God do that for me? But you see, God deals with all of us in different ways. And yes, there are some remarkable times in our lives when God deals with us and meets our need. There are other times when he leaves us often to struggle. And we say, well, Lord, I don't know what you're doing in this situation. He works in his own mysterious ways. But I think every single Christian will be able to say that there have been times in their life when God has met them in remarkable ways. And quite often, it's best to keep quiet about it and just say, thank you, Lord, thank you. That's one of the reasons why we don't have testimonies in, in the church. Testimonies aren't a bad thing, but we don't make a regular practice in church of saying, well, come on, come and tell us what God has been doing for you. Sometimes it's best just to allow the Lord to work and then to keep quiet. So the important point is that God does help and he works in wonderful ways because he is generous in his help. God works differently in all of our lives, but it's for us alone, isn't it? And we give him all the glory behind our closed doors. But God is generous. God is very generous. He, he meets this widow's need. There's lots of jars and, and, and they keep pouring. There's only a little oil, isn't there, in that flask. That's all she's got, just a little bit of oil. But she keeps on pouring, keeps on pouring, and it keeps filling all these jars until in the end there are just no jars left. And that's it because she's now got enough. In fact, she's got more than enough to pay the debts. You see how generous God is? He doesn't just give her just enough so that she can sell those and pay the debt and she's still in that situation of need. He says, no, I'm going to give you more than you need so that you can sell, pay the debts and live on the rest. And so she and her sons are able to survive. Wonderful. Such is our God, a generous, generous God. But then don't forget Luke 12 we said about fearing the Lord, having this great sense of the greatness of God and trembling before this God and not trembling before others. But then Jesus goes immediately on to say, you are worth more than many sparrows and every hair on your head is numbered by God. He knows exactly how many hairs you have on your head. So don't be afraid. If he knows that much about you, and if he cares for sparrows, and if you are so much more precious to him than sparrows, then you don't need to fear anything. He cares for you if you are his child. And that's the question, isn't it? Are you a child of God? Like this widow and her husband who feared the Lord. Are you a child of God? Do you belong to him? Do you know the Lord Jesus as your saviour? Because that's the crucial thing, isn't it? In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul says, in Romans in chapter 8, he says this. Romans 8 and verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If God has given his son for our sins. If Jesus has died on the cross for our sins, if God has been willing to give us the greatest and most precious thing that he ever had, his own dear son, and if the Lord Jesus was prepared to give his life for you, then do you doubt that he's prepared to give you all things that you need graciously? He will. But you need to know him first as your saviour, you need to know that your sins are forgiven first. That's your greatest need. And once you know that your sins are forgiven and that the Lord Jesus is your saviour, you will discover that he graciously gives you all things. So go to him and prove him and fear him and love him and believe him. And when you're desperate, if you belong to the Lord Jesus, remember he cares 
for you. Well, may God bless his word to all of our hearts. Let's sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn this evening is uh, number 612. 612. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? You who unto Jesus for refuge have fled. 612. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.